It's just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Joseph Daniel Jordan, JD. He's the founder of JPA Dental Transitions in Belmont, North Carolina. It's a suburb of the uh, North Carolina or what, what city is it in? Right outside of Charlotte. Uh, Charlotte. And yes. uh, have you recovered from that Super Bowl with the Denver Broncos yet? No. Yeah, I imagine I would still be in therapy. I'm so glad I don't bet money on games. No, I, that one still hurts a little bit. Your young, hot quarterback who could do a flip over the line and keep running against that old guy with a broken neck, I, I'm yeah. so glad. I knew the Carolina Panthers would just walk away yeah. with that game. Yeah. I'm so Thanks lucky. Thanks for bringing that up early, Howard. Appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> I want to give you an ulcer before we start. Joe, yeah. you, you go by Joe, right? Yes. So Joe is the founder of JPA Dental Transitions. After establishing practice as a dental-specific attorney, Joe saw that his skills in the legal profession could easily and valuably translate to the world of dental transitions. Now helping dental professionals throughout their practice tr transitions is one of the great joys of his job. Law remains one of his loves, uh, first loves, and he continues to work and own Jordan Law Group to serve the dental community. Joe also greatly enjoys his time speaking to dental schools, round robins, and on national dental lecture circuits around the United States. He is a proud husband and dad of two kids, but I don't know where he gets off of those two kids because on your LinkedIn profile, it's just you and some little cute guy in the chair. I take it yeah, that's, that's your one son? That's one of them? That, that is my son. That's, that's Jack. So he must be the older one. Well, he is the older one. Yeah, I have a little girl. The, does, she know, does she know that she's not in the photo on your LinkedIn profile? Not, not yet. Not yet. She will after she sees this. You better you better correct that. I, I have four boys. You can't play favorites. But um, my God, he is so adorable. Just my well, gosh. I appreciate it. He's, a, he's so, a smart little one. So I wanted, here. here's why I wanted you to bring on the show. First of all, uh, so many dentists ask for me to podcast you. But but here's here's the disconnect. In okay. dental school, they say, well, I'm, I'm, you know, the average graduates $285,000 in student loans. They say, I, I don't have the money to start my own, and, and I'm just going to go be an employee. And that's their nirvana. They think right. teenage, what is that nirvana song? Teenage spirit or teen spirit. Teen teen spirit. spirit. They, smells like teen spirit. <laughs> it smells like teen spirit. They come out. They say, yeah. you know what? It smells like the best thing to do is just go get a job at some DSO. Well, yeah. they, well, the turnover with the DSOs is so high that when I meet a dental student five years out of school, they've had five or six different jobs and it takes them. It, it, and usually they don't start their own practice till they're just like, I'm so given up and burned out. I'm so sick of doing the grind and all that. I'm finally going to open up my own. So I'm like, well, I graduated May 11, 87. I had mine open September 21, 87. Why do they spend five years chasing, it smells like teen spirit, when I, I, I know what it's going to smell like at the end, and what it smells like at the end is that dentists, physicians, and lawyers make horrible employees because they don't like to be told what to do. Every yeah. dentist and lawyer has it. I mean, look at the Supreme Court. You're a lawyer. Every ma They're all reading the same constitution, Yet every right. major decision is five to four. It's like yeah. they, they've never, when was the last time the Supreme Court voted nine to zero on yeah. anything? Yeah. So yeah. lawyers, yeah. dentists, and physicians, they're never going to agree on anything. So my specific question is, she just walked out of school $285,000 in debt. Can she buy a practice? Would you even recommend it straight at graduation? Would you tell her to wait a year? Talk to that kid yeah. who just walked out of school. Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and I think the you know, the initial gut reaction is absolutely. If you think you're an owner um, profile, and that's big for me and my clients, is what we tell them, and we catch a lot of doctors coming out early or in schools. We tell them, listen, you need to spend a little bit of time first to figure out whether you are an owner. Do you really want to own something, or are you somebody that really just loves doing dentistry and you want to go in and just do dentistry? And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. There's a huge need for that in the dental industry. But if you're truly an owner, uh, deep down, you know that, then you're not going to be happy until you own a practice. And so what can we do to get you on that ownership path to find that practice that's right for you? And my first quick answer is, can they buy something directly out of school? Do they have the ability, physical ability, clinically to buy and run a practice? Sure, I think they probably do. Uh, the problem is that the money is not there for the young doctor right out of school. 
So what we see with most of the specialized lenders is they're going to require at least a year track record of some sort. And that really is where we've, we've seen that, that year associateship uh, that a lot of doctors go into. They come out of school, they go into an associateship period for a year, then they roll out and they start looking at ownership options, uh, partnerships, uh, 100% ownership, or some, you know, some kind of ownership model that they can get into. But that is generally dictated by the lenders. Uh, a lot of young doctors think, well, I have all this student loan debt. I can't. There's no way I can get a loan. And they'll go three, four years, five years. You know, we're seeing the associateship period that used to just be a year. We're seeing it extend. It's over the past few years, it started to get a little longer, a little longer, a little longer. And we asked ourselves, why is that? You know, why are the doctors staying associates longer? I think there's a number of reasons, but the main reason is they feel like they need to be able to make money to float their student loans. They do have to have that year to really get the financing from the third-party lenders. So those two playing in conjunction with each other is pushing the associate out a little more and a little more. So the quickest we can get somebody into ownership with a third-party lender being involved is right at a year. Now, some caveats to that, of course, is that sometimes, I don't know what it is, why it is, sometimes a third-party lender will look at a deal and say, okay, we can get comfortable with it. And if that happens, they, I've seen, I've had clients that have gone into ownership two, three weeks after graduating. Does it happen? Yes. Is it the norm? Absolutely not. The norm is that one year production history out in the world of producing clinical dentistry for somebody, for somebody else, that they can then get the loan to buy the practice. And sometimes residencies can fall into that. We've had some lenders that have gotten comfortable with a residency and have lended. But you know, if it's a normal size practice you know, generating six to seven hundred thousand a year has a five hundred thousand dollar purchase price. Um, they're probably going to have to have at least one year experience before lenders going to jump in and do it. Okay, but you you have you have two children now, and my four children turn into five grandchildren. Does that baby dentist at twenty five does she even has she have enough self awareness to know if she's the owner profile? Talk to her, help her self discovery if she's an owner profile or if she's an employee or profile. Not. Yeah, yeah. I, if what I tell. Our clients is, you know, that's something that we can advise you to. We can say, here are the challenges of ownership. And the easy saying is you work in your practice from nine to five and own your practice from five to nine. Are you okay with that? You know, do you comprehend that the ownership side of practicing dentistry is, is really equal to the clinical side with the amount of hours you put in, the headaches that you handle? And some people are just better fit for that. Um, somebody that's just coming out of school, you know, do, you're right. Do they know 100%? Probably not, but I think they've probably had enough experience uh, through school, through jobs they've had here or there, that they know whether they can be comfortable working under somebody long term uh, or whether they like the management side, they like the business side, they like that tied in with the clinical side, and they ultimately have to make the decision. But I'll tell you this too, that one year that they come out that they are kind of spreading their wings a little bit in someone else's practice. There's a lot of knowledge that's learned there. So I am a fan personally of the one year associateship, of getting out and doing something to kind of just get your feet under you a little bit. I can tell you from personal experience, when I graduated law school, was you know, legally, could I practice law? Absolutely. You know, I could go into the courtroom, I could defend somebody, I could do all this stuff. How much of it did I really understand? How much of it did I really grasp? How much of running a firm did I really know? Zero. You know, I knew very little. Uh, and that's the way a lot of the doctors come out. Clinically, they're prepared, but from the business side, they they don't quite have the grasp. Now, it's getting better. I will say that. I think in the last five years, the graduates that we're seeing come out that are looking to get into ownership or are looking at it at some level are better prepared than they were. And I think that goes to the schools that have realized there's that gap. Um, and so with that training, with the uh, with the education in the school, changing a little bit more toward the business side with having advisors that are going and, and talking and spending some time with the students. I think that gives them a little bit of an idea to really be able to understand, am I someone that wants to own a dental practice? And especially within that year as an associate, seeing the way a business is run, um, figuring that out. Now, with the young associate that comes out and is licensed and talks and gets advisors around them and surrounds themselves with, with people that can help them make these right decisions, when they get into ownership or, or when they get into an associateship, 
and there is that mentor relationship between the host doctor and the young doctor, I think that goes a long way to them developing the idea of whether ownership is right for them. Now, I'm going to ask you a question, but I know the minute she hears me ask you this question, she's going to call phony baloney because you make a living in practice transitions. Sure. So why would you give her uh, any honest advice on should she start a de novo from scratch or buy old man Baker's dental office? <laughs> well, well, here's what I'll tell you. The majority of dentists out there are going to get into ownership at some some level. So if there's an opportunity out there, I, I think it makes a lot of sense to get into that ownership model because the majority are ultimately going to find themselves there anyway. Now, the market itself, and this is, again, something we advise our clients on, the le- whether it's the legal side and they just found us because they want something, or from the brokerage side, is there's not a lot of practices out there. I mean, if you look, the number of doctors that are coming out that are looking, actively looking for an acquisition to buy something that's running, uh, there are a lot more looking than are available. So a lot of times it's a an opportunistic decision. Uh, something pops up in the town that they want, and they know that, and they're more willing to, to go out on a limb a little bit and get into ownership because it's there. Do you have, so any, mac- about- do you have any macro numbers of how many graduated last year and how many old guys are selling? I, I do not, but what I can tell you just overall is the sheer number of doctors that we've had – this year that have contacted us specifically looking for a practice, you know, since January, we've had probably a, a hundred to 130 individual new people that are wanting to come into the North Carolina market. Uh, and there are nowhere near that many practices on the market. Yeah. So supply and demand. So if there's more buyers than more sellers, then I want to switch this whole interview around Old man McGregor wanting to sell his practice. It's a seller's market. Would you agree? Yeah, it's a good time to be a seller. Um, it, it's a good time, but it's also you've got more options in front of you than you've ever had. So a seller starting to reach out and talk to people about how do I transition out of ownership? How do I, uh, what does it look like? What's the model? What are my options? The options now are, uh, there are a lot more than there were years, even five, six years ago where it really was probably just going to be a changing of the guard in the dental practice. You would the, you would have the established doctor that sells to the solo doctor that comes in and just trades off. Now, of course, multi-doctor ownership, the increase in that has changed it. Um, management groups that are getting into ownership at some level have changed that. DSOs have definitely changed that. Um, fractional interest ownership, again, uh, even on a very small level, has changed that. So a lot of options are going toward the seller. So is it a good time? Yes, absolutely. Do you need to put some thought into what your plans are post-closing and how you want it to happen? Absolutely, because there's a lot more um, a lot more moving parts than there used to be. So this is a strange question, but back to do demographics matter? I mean, if you're buying an existing practice, it's working. I mean, the numbers are right there. Right. But if you're going to start a de novo... You really need good demographic. Do, do you think demographics matter more in a de novo since it's an unknown? And do the I, demographics matter less in a in a practice transition? Because, I mean, this office is doing it. There's no mystery to right. it. Yeah, I think demographic reports are a no-brainer if you're looking at doing a startup. Absolutely. Um, because you can think you know an area. You can think you know the competition. But I can promise you this. Every time I Google an area to just look at how many dentists are there, I'm always surprised by how many come up. So I think I know an area until I look at the data, then I find out there's a lot more competition here than I anticipated. And I think that's something that anyone doing a cold start should know. They should know the competition in the area. They should know the the patient demographics. And that's an easy thing. I mean, it's a very inexpensive thing now. There's a lot of information on the web that you can just Google and find. But there are some really good companies out there that do only that for dentists. Can you and name so them? I think that's some, can you name them? I, I cannot. I cannot. But what I can tell you is that I know they're out there and I know they're relatively inexpensive for the reports that they give. I've worked with a number of them. I don't have one specifically that I point to because they're really generally pretty geographically located. So if we have a doctor looking in, in the Charlotte area, there are firms that will only do the Charlotte area. So it's a good thing to have in a cold start scenario because more information is better than, than less information. Okay, so how, always, how, long have, how long have you been doing dental law? 
I've been de doing dental law since '04. So okay, so in uh, so it's let's just say it's, it's basically almost 2020. So you've been doing this for a decade and a half, just at a gut visceral level. Would it be mm -hmm. easier to succeed in the big cities of you know Charlotte and Nashville and Atlanta, or would you advise they go out to smaller towns in North Carolina like Rock Hill, Gastonia, Spartanburg, Hendersonville? I mean, what is 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 it easy, <laughs> is it easy to say rural is easier and more lucrative than urban or not really? Uh, I would I always tell doctors that if location is not the first thing on the list that they're looking for, then absolutely getting 15 minutes, 20 minutes outside of Charlotte is going to be easier in the long run and probably more lucrative in the long run than if you plant yourself in the middle of everything that's going on in a market like Charlotte, Raleigh, Nashville, anywhere across the United States that is um, heavily dependent on competition, uh, heavily driven by PPOs, um, just discount dentistry because it has to be, because the sheer amount of competition that's there. So it doesn't necessarily mean that practice ownership is easier, but what it means is you're more in control of your practice when you're outside of those high demand areas. Well, one one thing that um one thing that was a huge red flag is um you have heard of uh, East West Bank, right? Sure. And in twenty, I mean that that's are they are they headquartered in Charlotte or where where are they where are they at? I think they were. Yeah, I think they were. Are they still in the market? I didn't no, think they were no, still they, in the market. They exited the dental lending market in twenty sixteen, right. and this is twenty nineteen. Right. So three years ago. When one of the largest banks in America, the East West Bank, exit the dental lending market, what was the story behind the story? I mean, is that is that a red flag that this is not? A, I mean, a lot of people told me they had so many defaults in the DSO space that yeah. they they were overweighted and stopped. Is that what you yeah. heard? Well, you know, I I don't want to speak for East West Bank because I don't know the real reason behind why they made the moves that they did. But what I can tell you is. If you look at dental lending across the board, we have shakeups at a lot of the big banks pretty regularly. You know, they're they're changing their lending model, they're changing their underwriting terms. So as a transition advisor on the legal side and a transition advisor on the broker side, we're working with these banks all the time. So we have those relationships and it's not uncommon that we'll have um, a really, really good year uh, through the year with lending with one specific lender, then the next year, they change their model, and for some reason, something's happened. They've changed the way they do their underwriting, and now all of a sudden, our number one go-to lender is no longer really our go-to lender, and now we're looking for another lender. So there, it's definitely for the, I guess, for the regulations, for the underwriting, for everything that goes into lending at that level, there are a lot of moving parts, and when they get a little uncomfortable, uh, they change the game because they're not willing to take any losses. And when I talk to my lenders, they tell me all the time, they, they parrot the same thing. Acquisition defaults are less than half a percent. I mean, that's low. If you think about that, what else, what other industry has that kind of uh, safety and, and low default rate? I mean, it is low, low. So you know, what was it really that forced East West out? I, I don't know. Well, like restaurants have a 20 to 40% failure rate in 12 to yeah. 24 months. And here's dentists yeah. with a half percent. But, but you know, the problem when you talk about DSOs is people always think of the biggest players, you know, your Aspen, your Heartland, your Pacific. But most DSOs are two to three to four to five locations. And right. they were servicing 100 group practices and they said no more. So I uh, yeah. so I I don't know uh, what 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 all to make of that. Gut reaction is that those groups are still there. You know, those groups didn't all roll up and just leave. Uh, they just got out of the lending of it. So where are you getting most of your money? Is it Bank of America, Wells Fargo? I mean, who who are your major lenders? Yeah, I, I mean, you have the big you have the big players. Your your Wells Fargo, your First Citizens, your Bank of America. Uh, they're in the space and and they're doing a lot of business. Uh, you have your PNCs, your TD banks. They're in the space doing a lot. And then you have some of the smaller specialized lenders that are really good at what they want. And I know that sounds kind of weird, but you know they have their model that they like to lend. And if you have a deal that maybe isn't sticking immediately with one of the big lenders, there are a lot of other lenders that have carved out specific niches in dentistry, and they'll jump all over those deals. So just knowing where to look for the money half the time is, is the hardest part. But I would say the vast majority of 
lending is coming from those, those bigger banks. Now, within the last year, a lot of the local lenders, and I'm talking about really local, like your, your region, small regional banks, are getting more and more into deals. I can tell you uh, this year, the, a lot of the deals that we've done, there have been more local banks involved that have never done a dental deal before ever uh, that are involved in that are, are doing deals and taking them from some of the bigger lenders. I don't know what their end game is. I don't know if they're wanting to develop a dental lending um, leg or whether they just really want the local business, but we're seeing them get more and more involved. Do you usually, is your first choice usually Bank of America or Wells Fargo, First Citizens, PNC, TD? Is that usually, or are you, are you doing more local, regional banks? Well, a lot of times, I mean, we're not going to pick the bank. Of course, we're going to tell our clients, uh, if you want lending, we would suggest working with somebody that understands the dental industry. So that's really the number one thing. And we'll tell them, you know, here are people that understand dentistry. Uh, you're, they're not going to be surprised by your student loans. Uh, they're not going to be surprised by you know, anything else that has to do with the industry. Talk to them. And what I can tell you is just competitively, we see them come to the table more than than local banks. So do you, do you mostly see the psychology? I'm trying to crawl into the head of a young dentist. She's two to three yeah. years out of school. You know, it's like football, you know. Um, you, you need to learn how to do a basic block, a tackle, a pass, a catch. Um, then when they come out of school, they need to start learning how to do, you know, fillings and crowns and simple endo and, and all that. So, so they got their, they got down their basic block, tackle, endo, x-ray, cleaning, exam fillings. And there's, and they're starting to look at a practice. Do most of the time, do they have a city they want to go back to? I mean, do they say, I want to go home to Charlotte. That's where my mama is. I'm going to have a puppy and I want my mom there. Do they usually pick the location emotional reasons first? Or are they usually Absolutely. saying it's calling you for advice saying, where's the best economic decision to go? No, I would say easily 80% of the people that come through our doors already have a location picked. Um, now when those doctors, those other 20% come in and they say, listen, we're open. Those are my favorite because they are more open to the opportunity not the location. So I can help a doctor find a good opportunity, but finding the location they want sometimes extremely difficult. And sometimes they'll wait a year, two years, three years for something to pop up in the market they want, or they go the cold start route and, and do a cold start because it's in the market they want. So to answer your question, yes, it's almost always location driven. So, so what's, what's smarter for her to do? She wants to go home to Charlotte. So she gets on the free classified ads of Dental Town, or she goes, you, you list them on your website practices. Um, right. Your website is JPA Transitions. What does JPA stand for? John Paul and Associates? Yep. <laughs> Jordan Practice Advisors. Jordan Practice Advisors. Okay, so it's JP. I'm going to type that. Um, um, so you're the founder of JPA Dental Transitions, and JPA is, is Jordan... Practice advisor. Practice advisor. So here's my succinct question. So right. she goes to your website. She sees practices located, or she goes on Dental Town Classified Ads. She wants to go to Charlotte. Do you should she just go by and visit that dentist, that office, or should she, uh, or is that a bad idea? Why would that be a good idea? Why would that be a bad idea? That's a good question. Um, here's what I'll tell you. You know, honestly, I would love to sell her a practice. Absolutely. You know, that's that's how I make most of my living is selling dental practices. But what I can also tell you is because of the demand in an area like Charlotte and in most metropolitan areas right now, there's just nothing on the market. So knowing that, what I do see a lot of doctors doing is that doctor to doctor communication. So they go on and that any you know, Sally goes online and she's looking, okay, Joe doesn't have anything listed in Charlotte. Goes and looks at the other brokers. Okay, they don't have anything listed in Charlotte. Looks at classifieds. I don't really see anything. You know, maybe an old listing and they call it sold. So there's nothing on the market that they can find. What's their next natural step? Well, the next natural step is, well, shoot, I'm just going to reach out to the doctors myself. I'm going to start contacting them, writing them letters and doing that kind of thing. And the funny thing is, it works pretty well, And to be honest with you. So when we see those young doctors that are reaching out through study clubs, which I think is a really good idea. Uh, go to study clubs, get to know the doctors in your area and start talking to them. Now, is a doctor going to stand up in the study club and say, hey, guys, I'm still on my practice? Probably not. 
Uh, but having those, getting to know the people, having the conversations. So I think Sally or that young lady would be better suited if there's nothing in the market and she's, let's say she's on a timeline of being an owner within a year. Well, I can't guarantee a practice that fits her is going to come up in a year and neither can anyone else. So Sally can, to some degree, take the reins herself and start reaching out to people, making relationships, uh, talking to people in the dental industry to be one of the first to know if a practice comes up. And how do I know this works? I know this works because our law office does a lot of transactions in Charlotte that are doctors that have talked to other doctors. No broker involved. They just got together and they made the deal work. And they happen every day. There are deals happening. So the market is kind of interesting because if you look at it from the broker side, any broker, well, shoot, we'd love to know they're for sale. But a lot of times in these high demand areas, they never even come up on the broker's radar because of pre-existing relationships or because the doctor knows they don't need a broker um, or they think they don't need a broker. And that gets into confidentiality issues and how it's how is that doctor going to market their practice? But when we see those kind of hand in hand relationships that are made through study clubs or maybe a colleague or yeah, I mean, they happen and they happen a lot. So again, I would love to sell our practice and I wish I would have 30 on the market that I could sell a young doctor like that, that wants to be in the area and wants to take over a practice and own. But fact of the matter is there's just not that kind of inventory on the market. So what is Sally going to do in the meantime? She has to decide. She's either going to stay an associate for a long period of time and wait, wait for the right opportunity to come up, and maybe it will, maybe it won't, or she's going to do a cold start, which I think a lot of doctors see as a, a very difficult undertaking. Well, I mean, you have to think all the practices that are on the market right now, they were started at some point. Uh, so that is a very viable option, but as you pointed out earlier, demographic reports, kind of getting your ducks in a row before you do a cold start. Of course, those are important things to do. So there are some options, and I think one of those options that she needs to keep in mind is doing a little bit of the uh, the footwork herself, getting out there and trying to make connections with doctors. I don't see any problem with that. Okay, I want you, I want you to talk um, both sides of the same coin, buyer, seller. Okay. What should a young dentist be looking at when they're looking at acquiring a practice? And then the flip side of that, if you're an old guy like me and you're thinking you might want to be selling your practice down the road, how early should that guy want to sell his yeah. practice? How long does, should he be thinking about that? And then he's thinking, would I, you know, I'll you give you an example in real estate. A lot of people say, well, I'm going to fix up my house. I'm, I'm going to add a pool so it'll be nicer right. to sell. But a real estate agent <laughs> right. will say that you won't get your money back. Don't do that. If you put a $10,000 pool in there, you're not going to get $10,000 more for your house. So a lot of old right. dentists are saying, well, should I get new chairs and paint? So talk both sides of the coin because it's the same coin, you know? Sure. Yeah, I, I think let's hit the seller first. Um, I generally advise my sellers not to go in and make big purchases right before they sell, not to go in and uh, repaint or recarpet or do any of that because almost every time a buyer's going to come in and do what they want anyway. So uh, the seller may paint it green, and then a buyer's going to come in next week and repaint it blue because they wanted it blue. So it, all you're really losing is an immediate, like that first gut reaction of walking in and seeing a green wall as opposed to, to whatever it was. Now, should they clean a little bit? Should it look inviting and warm? Yeah, absolutely. Because a buyer is going to walk in and they're going to, and this is their first time really touching it. They've been looking at numbers. They've been reading reports. They've been building this idea of what the practice is in their mind, but they haven't touched it. They haven't seen it. So when that buyer walks in, you can generally tell very quickly whether the, the buyer is going to make a move on this practice or not. Um, but again, that doesn't necessarily mean it needs to be, oh, you know, good thing they just bought that Syrac uh, because that's what's going to sell the practice. Well, it probably is not what's going to sell the practice. And this, the seller is not going to recoup dollar for dollar the investment of all this new equipment right before they sell. So what we tell our sellers is, listen, when we portray this practice to a buyer, when we look at the, the data, the reports, the financials, and we bullet down into a concise report that we give a buyer to review with their advisors and CPAs and attorneys, you know, that is the practice as it runs. That is the practice as it has run for years, uh, and it is a snapshot into the practice as of today. So that's without all the new equipment. That's without all the fresh paint. That's without all this stuff. So the basic or the vast majority of the information a buyer is going to process to buy a practice is the cash flow, the numbers. 
Uh, you know, what is it doing? How healthy of a practice is it? That's what they're looking at. So for a seller, I would always say, don't go out and spend a lot of money trying to, to pretty it up right before you sell it because you're not going to recapture that in, a per, in the sell price or what you get for the practice. Now, from the buyer's side, what should they look for? A lot of what I just said, financials, uh, reports, uh, chart audits, going in and just looking at the chart, seeing how a doctor does dentistry. These are all important things, but also having an idea of, of course, the age of the equipment, what upfits need to be made from day one going in, and all these are things that need to be kept in mind when they make that initial offer. But for us and for most buyers and for the lenders and for the other advisors, cash flow is really where it sits. That is the first hurdle that most buyers and lenders have to get through. So they want to know what is the historical revenues of this practice? What is the overhead, reported overhead of the practice? What's the adjusted overhead of the practice? And when I say adjusted, all we're doing is simply adding back um, discretionary spending that a seller runs through a practice to find the true, really, what does it cost for somebody to come in and run this practice? Once we have that number, then we can say, okay, here are the dollars that are left over for you, buyer. If you buy this practice, this is what we assume will be left over for you. Does that number work for you from a cash flow standpoint, from a personal debt service standpoint? And the advisors and the buyers are going to look at that and they're going to make some type of determination as to whether the practice cash flows. If it cash flows, well, then we're going to go to the next step. And that's going to be you know, going in, seeing the practice, poking around, looking at the equipment, um, seeing what the practice looks like, what needs to be done to it. So I think for a buyer, it's important to look at the data of the practice. Of course, revenues staying steady is a good sign. So three years out, we want to look, uh, well, what we tell sellers is three to five years out before you sell. And that's not when you want to be slowing down. That's not when you really want to be taking a lot of time off. That's not when you want to be doing a lot of traveling. Those three to five years before you sell is going to be the snapshot, the window that any buyer and appraiser and everyone else that is reviewing your practice, that's what they're going to see. So we want them to see good numbers. We want a seller to exit on the high. Um, now, not all sellers can do that because people sell for a lot of different reasons. But in the ideal scenario, we have a practice that has maintained revenues in the last three years or slightly increased revenues over the last three years. I mean, at that point, it immediately looks healthy because revenues are staying the same. When we have revenues that are dwindling, you know, fifty to $100,000 a year over the past three years, the first question we get always from the buyer, from the lender, from the CPA, from the attorney, why are revenues falling? And they always assume it's because patients are leaving or because the market has cooled down in the area or something. It's never that, well, the sellers just really slowed down. They're, they've hit that seller mentality. They're thinking more retirement than they're thinking practice. And it's starting to slow down. And that's really not when we want a seller getting in and selling their practice. But that's when most of them do. Uh, but things like that, that's what a buyer can look at to get a real good just reaction as to whether uh, this practice is going to fit for them or not. But it all comes down to cash flow. Well, what scares you? You said cash flow. I mean, there's, you know, the, the P&L, the profit and loss, the statement of income that you send yeah. to the IRS. Um, there's yeah. a statement of cash flow. And then there's a balance sheet. What balances... Uh, your the equity you have into something minus the liability you owe, but it's my understanding that there's not a dentist out there that knows the difference, knows what a statement of cash flow is or a balance sheet. They they only talk about P and Ls because they say things all the time like, "Well, my practice does seven hundred and fifty thousand a year. They they pretty much sell one time sales." And I'm like, "Well, what if you have a practice that does seven fifty a year and only netted fifty thousand? And another yep. practice had 750 and netted 250. The one that netted 250 would be worth five times more. Right. So so they always talk in sales and they don't know what EBITDA is, earnings before interest, right. tax, appreciation, amortization. So do you agree <clears throat> that it's not a multiple of revenue? It's a multiple of it, profit? Yeah, I, it definitely. Profit has to come into it. And that's when we talk about cash flow. You have to know what the practice is cash flow. So... You're right. A lot of people will throw out that number and you know, all across the nation, set percentage of gross of last year's earnings comes up a lot. That's what people hear because it's easy to say. It's easy to say, oh, yeah, my practice sold for this number and it was some percentage. Well, I give people ranges. Yeah, I see practices sell all the time from 50 percent to 110 percent of revenues. That's a pretty big range. 
you know, it's going to fall somewhere in there. And that's always the first question we get when we sit down with the seller is, well, what do you think it's going to sell for? And that's a really good question. And that's something that we can determine uh, and we can get a real good idea of what it's going to sell for, but I can't just give you a number. So in order to find that number, the, you know, the, the percentage of a sale price really, it leans more toward like a market approach valuation. Uh, and if it, a practice cash flows, if there is enough left over at the end of the day to work, well, then yeah, it might sell for 80 or 90% of its gross. But that doesn't mean that that is the one indicator, that percentage is the indicator of the value of a practice because it's really not. Um, the practice being able to support itself, there being enough money to pay the debt service for the practice and also pay the debt service of the, the doctor buying the practice is very important, obviously, because if they can't afford to pay the debt service, they can't afford to buy the practice. That's why you see a lot of people recently, you hear more about EBITDA than ever. Um, and a lot of that also comes in because the corporate groups that are buying up group practices, that's what they advertise. They say, we will pay you this multiplier of EBITDA to acquire your practice. So the more that that's getting out, the more we hear sellers talking, getting away from the percentage and getting more into the EBITDA side. But its range is all over the place as well. So to just be able to put a blanket across the board, this is what practices sell for, you can't. Uh, because then that would be a very easy thing to do. You would see a lot of dental practice appraisers immediately go out of business because you could just rubber stamp a percentage across the board, and that can't happen. What is the so range of EBITDA that you see them selling on? I'm sorry? You, you, what is the range of EBITDA that you're seeing? Four, six, seven, uh, you know, somewhere in that range. We, we see them there. Um, we hear crazier numbers. I mean, I've heard people talk about, I got a flyer that that said they would buy my practice today for ten times EBITDA, and you know I haven't personally seen those, but I've heard that thrown out a lot. Um, maybe it's happening somewhere, but it's not happening in my market. Well, I see. Um, what I see is that EBITDA range goes high if you have ten locations because it, it, that's right. Multiple if you have, locations. For sure. If you have, you know, the the sweet spot of bankruptcy is really somewhere between two and four locations because. When you, when you set up your own office, you're crushing it because you live there, your team's there, you're all sort of there, but you don't know what your weaknesses are. And as you go to a second and a third and a fourth location, your weaknesses that were a little Doberman pincher in your one office have now turned into Godzilla and and <laughs> and destroy the price. I mean, I, I've seen so many bankruptcies at the three to four million mark. So if yeah, you that's have- a good point. So if you have five locations or six locations or seven locations, they're paying a higher multiple even dollars. You're saying, "Oh my God, you figured it out! You crossed, yeah. you crossed the chasm." Yeah. I mean, I mean, when yeah. you're standing, when you're on your way to Vegas, you see the Grand Canyon. It looks pretty, but to go all the way down, cross the Colorado River, and come back up is a huge achievement. It's about the length of a marathon. So when they say, "Wow, this guy's got it," so what they're paying extra for is the management team. They're saying this yeah. guy, this guy could get ran over by a Mack truck, but he's got a ton of people in here that that know how they're running it. Um, you know, I I want to I want to tell you, um, I'm not a lawyer and I don't do what you do, but I'll, I'll tell you what I've seen good and bad in buying and selling mm -hmm. and practices is some dentist will go buy a practice and this guy does all these massively big full mouth rehab cases, and this little kid doesn't realize that to diagnose treatment plan present the treatment, case close, he doesn't have that skill. I, I saw a guy in, in my backyard who bought an office for $1.2 million. It collected about $1.2 million a year, and the first year he had it, it collected six hundred and fifty because he simply didn't have those skills. I'll see it again where they'll buy some practice, and it's doing seven hundred fifty dollars a year, but he did $100,000 of molar endo, and she just decided out of nowhere that she doesn't like molar endo and refers yeah, it all. Yeah. You know, say, same with yeah. any of the 10 specialties now. Where I've seen the gold mine is a guy buys an office doing seven fifty dollars a year, and this dentist hates endo, never has done endo, and this kid loves endo. So he bought a practice for seven fifty, dollars and the first year it jumps up to eight fifty dollars or nine fifty. dollars because he did all of his endo. So my first thing to, I say, if I was analyzing a practice, first thing, when when they when the broker says they collected 750, I'd want to see a procedural printout, procedure a procedure yeah. say, well, what did he do? I mean, I can do the hygiene, I can do the operative, I can do the crown and bridge. But if you start crossing off, I don't do endo, and that was a hundred grand, well, you, you're not buying an office collecting 750 if 
a hundred yeah. grand of its endo and you don't do endo. Do you agree with all that? Yeah, absolutely. I think where we're seeing that become more of an issue is with ortho, with uh, doctors that are doing Invisalign and that are getting a GPs getting into that side of it and have really built a big section under their roof of ortho. And then we have a doctor that comes in and says, oh, by the way, I don't do ortho. Well, then this probably is not a good fit for you because we're taking a 30 percent cut off the revenues immediately by doing that. So buyers absolutely need to see a procedure mix. They absolutely need to see a referred out list. You know, tell me what you're referring out. Uh, I like production by code, production by ADA code, so we can go in and look, okay, exactly what did they do? Uh, that way we can see if they're doing what our buyer is really set up to do well or whether they're going to continue sending them out the door. Because if you think about it from a buyer standpoint, a lot of buyers today are coming out with a broader procedure mix than the average seller, I would say. So if they're able to come out and do more procedures than the seller that is slowing down and kind of gotten comfortable in their practice, well, that's immediate revenue that they're recapturing that's already under the roof. No marketing dollars spent for that, nothing. They can capture it immediately right there before it's referred out of the practice. And it only takes a couple minutes to figure that out. But absolutely, if they are not going to do something that is a major revenue stream of the practice, it's going to be a problem, and it's not going to be a good fit for, for that buyer or for the seller because it's going to come back to bite them later. The the best practice I've ever seen by, and um, a friend of mine agreed with me that it was the best we'd all ever seen. A, a dentist was doing 500000 a year. He patched everything with amalgam. He didn't do crown and bridge, and he didn't do endo. He'd, he'd been doing it. He was like 70 years old when he sold. This guy bought this little practice, three operatories with old equipment, and on average, every day, four MODBL amalgams would just crumble and either need a thousand dollar crown or a two thousand dollar root canal billet crown. He worked four days a week, bought this practice for five hundred. It did a million five. I mean, it was the sweetest deal ever. You know, humans are so complicated. Some people want to buy your practice, and the minute they buy your practice, they say, "Okay, Joe, here's your check. Buy." And then some uh, people are saying, "No, you want him." to check all a uh, six months worth of recalls and introduce you to everybody. And does that affect the value of the practice? If I give Joe um, a check and he cashes it and, and moves to Hawaii it, or do I want to. So, so yeah, what's the I, pros I think, and cons of should I, should I stay or should I go? Wasn't that a class song? Should I stay or should I go? Yeah. I think the doctor should definitely stay unless there's some type of extenuating circumstance. Now, I'm not talking about staying from a production standpoint. I don't necessarily want that seller staying to do productive dentistry because a lot of times, if it's a solo doctor practice, the doctor that's buying it needs to do 100% of the production. But where we do really want the doctor to stay is just from a goodwill standpoint. You have to remember, a lot of the dollars that you're paying for practice is going to personal goodwill to buy the goodwill of that seller. A lot of times, up to 80% of the, the total purchase price is allocated to the personal goodwill to that selling doctor. Well, shoot, I mean, if I'm paying every 80 cents, every dollar I'm paying is going to this, this person's good name and, and reputation in the community. I need to make sure I'm recapturing some of that that is coming back to me as the buyer. So how do we do that? Well, a lot of times we do it by having the doctor stay around at some level post-closing. Doesn't have to be an everyday thing. It can be a couple of days this week, a couple of days next week glad handing with patients, just talking to them, meeting with them, answering questions that staff has, uh, answering questions that the new owner has about certain patients and treatment plans that were put in place before they bought. Um, the selling doctor is going to need to finish up some cases, so they need to be there doing that. So yes, I like the buyer staying around from a non-productive standpoint post-closing to help transfer that goodwill to make sure everything's smooth and everybody understands what's going on. Uh, where I see it get kind of iffy is when we have a single doctor practice and we're trying to shoehorn two producers in the practice. So the buyer's trying to do dentistry and pay the debt service for the practice they just bought. And the seller had a fantasy of staying on and working after selling the practice. There's really not room for both of them. At that point, it, it's going to get tough because then you have uh, two people fighting over the same dollar and the seller's already received their purchase price, uh, but they're still wanting to stay around after. And, and you have to remember during the negotiating of all this, during the, the the courting between the buyer and the seller, they're trying to make this deal work. And the buyer's really trying to go out and, and be nice and, and help this process move along. So when the seller says, oh, I've, I've thought about staying on after, uh, the buyer's almost always going to say, oh, yeah, we'd love to have you stay on. 
And that's just, that's what most people do. Because like you said, most people, humans are complicated people and they want to please and they, they want to help the transition move along. So they say that and to the buyer, staying on after means one thing and to the seller, staying on after means a very different thing. So having that uh, conversation up front with your advisors and with everybody involved in the deal is important. And what I mean by that is if you're a seller and you think, listen, I want to sell my practice, I want to get out of ownership, but I don't necessarily want to get out of dentistry. I still love dentistry. I still want to do dentistry. I just don't want the management headache of running a dental practice. I just want to do dentistry. Well, if you're going to sell your practice, that needs to be very upfront and clear when the practice is being marketed that the seller expects to stay on. Because if it's known up front, well, then maybe a buyer will pass on it because they know they need to generate 100% of the revenues. But there are some other profiles of buyers that need a doctor to stay on, wants the doctor to stay on and run that practice while they're running maybe these other practices. So there is a good match for that if it's known up front. Where we see it become an issue is where we there's that miscommunication up until closing, and then we get to closing and we're negotiating how the doctor's going to stay after and it becomes an issue, uh, and we're trying to figure it out at the ninth hour uh, before closing. Because for a lot of these doctors, a lot of the sellers, for so many years they've run it. I mean, this is a huge asset that they've built over the years. Their staff is like family members, their patients are like family members. So when they have to take off that owner hat and put on an associate hat, uh, sometimes that's a tough mental step for some of the doctors to make. And if it doesn't go well, it never, it, it, the interactions between the new owner and the host owner associate now uh, are generally very, very rough. Yeah, if you want to have a lot of employees, you should have them be 18 years old and high school dropouts or you know, who makes the worst employees? Highly educated older people, That's dentists, right. physicians, right. lawyers. Dentists, physicians, and lawyers make horrible employees because they're too damn smart and they're they're confident and they're highly educated. And that's that's not who you want uh, to just be taking orders and, and doing stuff. I, I want to ask you a couple more um, plays. Um, so she's listening to you now and she her advice was initially, yeah, you just graduate. You, you need to go get a job for someone. And um, all that kind of stuff. But you also do dental law. Um, whenever she applies at a DSO, they say, well, this contract, you just got to sign it. There, There's no negotiation in the contract. Right. Is that what you're, what you're seeing in the real world? Or do the big DSOs, uh, do they make modifications? Uh, some Sometimes we get a, you know, just hard across the board. We don't make revisions. Uh, and generally, if we get that very early on, then that's a conversation we're going to have with our client that this probably is not a good move for them because we can't protect you. We can't put any. Is that just a? Is that just like the really big ones, like over five hundred locations, or, well, or not, is that not, not a way know, to split them up? No, sometimes it's really a hit and miss because I've seen some of the bigger ones that are very willing to be uh, flexible on the terms. Because think about it this way: the biggest thing when I talk to when I talk to her and I'm explaining to her. Plan for the future. You know, think about what you want to do. Get an idea of where you want to be in five years because what you do that year out, how you bind yourself in a contract is probably going to have some ramifications of what you're able to do after that one-year contract. So they're going to sign an employment agreement that has a probably has a restrictive covenant, has a termination notice, uh, has a lot of different handcuffs on her once she signs it. So she's going to want to negotiate compensation. She's going to want to negotiate days off. She's going to want to negotiate those everything that has to do with the compensation package. When I know that she wants to buy a practice in a year, the only thing I'm worried about uh, arguing with is the restrictive covenant terms and the notice period to get out of the contract. And that's not necessarily what's on the front burner for her. But for us, it is because I know she wants to buy a practice when it pops up. Well, then I need to know that the restrictive covenant is not massive, uh, that it's reasonable, and it's something that we can carve down to where it really – is the, as minimal as it can be and still protect the interest of the owning or the host doctor, and then that the notice period for the termination uh, clause is short, I mean, you know, 30 days, 60 days at most. But that's where we see it swing really wildly. I'll see 120 days on a notice period, and we'll talk to our clients and say, listen, we know that you want to buy a practice in a year or two years or three years or whatever you decide to do. If you have to give 120 days notice to get out of this contract, you're probably going to miss any opportunity that would come up in the area. So being able to move and have that flexibility to give 30 days notice and get out and to have a restrictive covenant that doesn't bind you from where you ultimately want to be in the future, 
that's where we're going to spend most of our time. And if we have somebody that's been very upfront that, listen, we don't negotiate, and it has a very large uh, termination notice and has a very large uh, restrictive covenant, or if it's for the area that we know they want to go as a future dental practice owner, and there's not a whole lot we're going to be able to do, you know, we're going to tell them, listen, we wouldn't advise that you sign this. And they've told us that they're not willing to negotiate the contract at all. And you know, we would always advise that you maybe look for something else because the, the biggest mistake I see young doctors make is of course they want to go to where, where they want to live. They immediately come out of school and they want to go back home or they want to go back to their area and they get an associateship position in that area. And the problem with that is they've immediately cut themselves out of the area they want to be in. I know. So they then work outside the area for two years to wait for the restrictive covenant to lapse. And then they can come back in and buy and it just complicates things. So if nothing else, something in a, so, a future associate should keep in mind is, you know, maybe negotiate and, and pick somewhere 15, 20 miles outside where you want to be. Maybe negotiate your restricted covenant down and your termination notice down and take a little bit of cut in the pay if you have to, because you really only have to do it for a year. You know, then you're going to get out. Then you're going to buy your own thing. Here's another it's simple nuts. rule of thumb that I've just seen in 31 years. <clears throat> so like, like Phoenix, Arizona, you, you, you come out here to Phoenix and you, you meet this girl and she's from Canada and she's moved to Arizona for the weather. She moved to Charlotte for the, the, the Panthers alive, all this stuff. But the minute they drop a frog, half them women want to go right back to where their mama lives because she knows her deadbeat husband isn't going to help her babysit and take care of the kids. They, they just want that, that family. So if you're married in dental school and your wife's from this town and you're from this town and you don't know what to do, how about just cross out those two towns and go get a job as an associate anywhere else because there might be a time and a day and a newborn baby where you might want to go back to this town. And if, if you want to go back to Salina, Kansas, well, go get a job in Wichita because if you yeah. go get a job in Salina, Kansas and somebody writes a restricted covenant and says you can't practice for five miles in two years, you just blew a lot of your options. So the, the neat thing about an associate job is I loved your quote where you say, you know, an uh, uh, owner profile dentist, you know, sees patients 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., but then owns the practice from 5 p.m. to 9 a.m. the next morning. Um, so, you know, one good thing about an associate, you just work 9 to 5 and don't have it be where it's on your short list of where you want to live because um, that could be a really bad idea. Um, and the restricted covenant. And, and then what are you seeing for um, how long a notice? Because I know some dentists, I, I see this all the time on Dentaltown, where someone says, you know what, I've had it, and they walk out on you. And then yeah. but due to their contract, all the money they had coming in, they just they just lost all their money coming in, or they're yeah. charged $500 a day. What, 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 do, what do you think is reasonable on a restricted yeah, covenant see, and a time of notification? Notice period. Yeah, I see third or 60 to 90 days pretty commonly just at, on the first draft that comes across for the notice period. So if I have to give you notice to leave and to exit the contract, to terminate it, I have to give you 60 days written notice to do it or 90 days. That's, that's pretty much what we see. For an owner associate, for somebody that knows they want to own, I really suggest that they get that down to 30 uh, because then they're able to move a lot uh, quick, a lot more quickly if something were to come up in their area. Sometimes it's give and take to get it down to 30, but I think personally it's I would be more willing, knowing they want to own something sooner rather than later, to give a little bit to get that shorter notice period to be able to get out and jump and maybe get ahead of the competition that is looking for that practice. Now, as far as the restrictive covenant goes, for an employee, I don't like anything over 18 months. I just, you know, it, there's a lot of states are, they enforce restrictive covenants. But they have been very clear to say it would be against public policy for us to not allow people to make a living in the in the career they're trained to do. So anything over 18 months, I think, is uh, what I would call burdensome for an employee. But that doesn't necessarily translate over to a seller. So courts have been very clear. Again, they're much more willing to put a long restrictive covenant on a seller that's received value for their their assets as opposed to just a young employee trying to make a living that goes out and you know, signs. And here's another place they get burned a lot is they'll go and, and more and more of the market is owned by entrepreneurial groups or DSO groups or whatever it may be. And they'll have five practices in their state or maybe more specifically in their area. 
And when they sign that restrictive covenant, they don't pay a whole lot of attention to it, but it says that it's five miles or 10 miles. Oh, that doesn't seem that bad. Five, 10 miles, that's not too much. But then it's from every location that's owned by the employing group. And that five miles then becomes uh, you know, half the state because the practices are located in these different areas. So it, it's an area, again, that doesn't seem glamorous and nobody really wants to spend a lot of time reading their restrictive covenants. But that's where a lot of doctors we see that are looking to transition into ownership uh, hit they hit a stumbling block because yeah absolutely we would love to help you get into ownership and get into this practice but we have contractual restrictions because of the employment agreement that was signed by the potential buyer you know humans are territorial if you let your dog out of the front door the first thing he's going to do is go pee on all four corners of, of the yard some some dentists you know they they can buy a practice for 750 but the owner's selling the land and building, and that's another, you know, seven fifty. And yeah. the owner's willing to have you sign a five year, ten year lease. Um, what what do you say to that dentist? How how do you evaluate that I just want to buy the business of dentistry and not the land and building? Because I know what the territorial Homo sapiens gonna do. He's gonna he wants to beat his chest and own the land and dirt. Is is owning yeah. land and dirt a good idea, a bad idea? How do you advise uh, that? I, you know, I think I think right now with the the uh, lending marketplace, interest rates, I think owning the real estate, if it's possible, is a good idea. I like it. Uh, it gets rid of a couple issues. One, your payment is almost always less than the rent, uh, and two you don't have the seller that is the landlord for the next five to 10 years. Sometimes that's not a problem. Sometimes it becomes a problem. Uh, so knowing early on in the transition, as we always ask our sellers, do you own the real estate? Is it, is it an option in the sale? Because we do see a lot of buyers that are coming to the table that want the real estate if it's available. Like you said, if it's there, it's on the table. If they can wrap up both at the same time, why not? Why not go ahead and get it? Interest rates are low. Money's pretty cheap. Uh, let's go ahead and get it. But on the flip side of that, a lot of the lenders for these solo doctors that are buying their first practices, they're not going to finance the practice and the real estate at the same time. So we might have a doctor that wants to sell the real estate. We might have a buyer that wants to buy the real estate. But we have a lender that says, eh, you know, you, you're kind of hitting your limit here with how much we can give you. Buy the practice now, lease it for two to three years, and then we'll look at financing the real estate for you after you know, some period of time. Then we have to go to the seller and get them to agree to be a landlord for some period of time, hopefully work in some type of option to purchase, definitely a first right of refusal, because worst thing that could happen for our client is that they buy the practice, they then try to buy the real estate, can't, and then the seller says, well, shoot, I'm just going to sell it to somebody else. And then we have a third party landlord come in the mix and it just really throws things uh, into a kind of a tailspin. So Buy the real estate? Yeah, I, I think so. I think if it's an option and you can swing it, I think it's generally a better bet. I want to ask you a very high-end, very elite dental question. Um, you know, I graduated from high school in 80, and that's the worst economy I ever saw. I mean, 21% interest rates, double-digit inflation unemployment. Then I graduated uh, May of 87, and Black Monday was October of 87, I, you know, and uh, and then there was the longest expansion, then the Y2K bubble pop, March of uh, 2000, and then Lehman's Day was, you know, 2008, you know, uh, um, and, and all those plummets and drops, I mean, you know, everybody talks about, you know, the sky is falling. Well, I've lived through four of them. I mean, you know, the, yeah. okay, so, so everything looks crappy for a year or two, but now I'm getting a lot of dentists saying... Howard, everybody knows that stock market's overvalued. Everybody knows that the corrections around the corner. And some of them are thinking, should I should I sell all my stock and buy a satellite practice? I mean, I should I take seven hundred and fifty thousand out of my stock portfolio and buy a dental office? Um, you know, five miles down the street, seven miles down the street. And a lot of these guys are looking at their four hundred one k. And they're looking at a satellite price. So I'm asking you, do you yeah. think it's a better investment to own another dental office or having all your stocks and the and the all your money in the S and P 500? Uh, I, I, you know, my my gut reaction would be leave the money where it is. And I think if we know anything, is that the market comes and goes, uh, and being long in the market is better than making rash decisions, pulling money out and spending them on something else. 
Do I think dentistry is a safe bet? Absolutely. I think dentistry is a safe bet. And I think we advise our clients to that every day. And you do what you do because you feel like long-term dentistry is a safe bet. And I think that we can look at all the markets that interact with the field of dentistry and that uh, build their their practice on the, the field of dentistry. And we can say that it's a safe bet. Do I think ownership is safe? Yes, I do. Do I think you should you know, uh, sell your, your all your cars and liquidate everything so that you can get that one other practice? Uh, probably not, because there is a lot that goes into multi-practice ownership. Uh, you really need a good model in place. There are a lot of people that get into it and realize, okay, this is not what I thought it was going to be. You know, I thought it was just going to run itself, and you know, the money was just going to come in, and I was going to do my thing, and maybe hop over there a day a week or maybe a day a month and just make sure it's running okay. Unfortunately, that's not the way it generally works out with satellite locations. Uh, so we see a lot of people, I, I mean, we have, I mean, at least a handful a year uh, that come to us and just sell a satellite location because it's not really what they thought it was going to be or it's taking more time than they thought it was going to. So, uh, you know, I think there's a profile for people out there that can do it and do it very well uh, and that can get out there and make a very good uh, return on investment in multiple practices but I wouldn't say just go out there and become a multi-practice doctor because you can't. You need three times the management team to have a second location. And yeah. uh, usually the only good thing to come out of a satellite practice is to expose all the failures in your systems. And yeah. so you get a second location and then it's just a nightmare. And then some yeah. people are so bullish because they're emotionally, well, I want to open up one office every year and then, and then the, the, the earth goes around the sun, which has no correlation to your management team. And then they open a third location. And the only good thing that came out of that is now you've leveraged yourself to sink or swim. You either got to get the right people on the bus to figure this all out. And you survive that. That's why your EBITDA starts going up because at four, right. five, six, seven locations, you figure that. But man, it's it's so brutal. Yeah. Um, it, it, is, it is. And I, it think, is so brutal. I think one example that really points it out is you can look, there are a lot of satellite practices that are run. Of course, they're associate run always, of course, because the doctor that owns it, they have to run their other practice. And when it's only two practices, sometimes three, you still have that doctor that's spending the majority of their time in one practice and they have associates running the others and one starts falling off. And that's when they call us and they say, hey, look, I want to sell off this practice. Well, then we find a solo doctor to buy that satellite and they go in and they run it like gangbusters. Numbers go up. Um, the, the staff loves them. Everything turns around. The practice is just on the right track. Well, that's because they they got in there and it was their practice. And they were running it like it was their own. And they the owner mentality was there running the practice. So what that tells me is, can you have an associate that runs a practice by themselves solely as the acting like the owner but is not, and you're paying them to be there, can they run a successful practice and grow it? Well, sure, they can, and I've seen situations where that happens. But what I can tell you is more often than not, a satellite run solely by a non-owner uh, generally doesn't grow like it does when an owner, solo owner, owns that practice. So they have to also keep that in mind when they're thinking about multiple locations. Just because it's there and just because the historical revenues have been good in that practice, when you bought it from the person that owned it for 30 years and built it up and ran it every day, and you plug an associate in there doesn't mean that the historical revenues are going to continue like they always have. Uh, it, we're then working with a totally different producer, totally different ideology, totally different personality, and all those things are going to translate somehow, and they're only going to work till five. You know, they're not going to hang around and handle the issues afterwards. They're going home, and so then the owner of those three practices have to pick up the slack across the board, and it's tough. I mean, we, we tell people regularly, Three practices, at that point, you're having to determine whether you like doing dentistry or not because you're really managing more than you're doing anything. Uh, and that's three practices. is It's a lot, but it's really not a lot. And it's only three locations. And a lot of people think they can handle that easily, but then they get into it and find out that the management of three is just eating up all their time. Uh, we went over an hour. Can I hold you for some overtime questions? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay. Cause I that was got quick. When they're out there looking at brokers like yourself, there's right. one brokerage firm, and I'll say its name because it's Dentistry Uncensored, uh, AFCO, where they, they talk about dual brokerage. They say, we want to represent the buyer and the seller because that that just, let's just get the deal done. Then there's other people who say, no, 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 each, each side needs their own broker. But the counter argument of that is um, it's more complicated and the lawyers you know, fight. Do you believe in dual brokerage or not really? 
Uh, I will say I'm absolutely biased on this <laughs> specific issue because of my training as an attorney. You know, it is hammered in our heads early that you don't dual represent. You just don't because there's no way you can adequately represent one party when you're also representing a party across the table. So that is deeply ingrained within me. So I, what I'll say is I don't do it. I can see the reasoning uh, behind why there are groups that do. And, you know, they say, well, it helps us. It helps us keep it kind of under our umbrella and it helps us keep it safe from people that will come in and will just wreck the deal. And that is absolutely true. I mean, there are, I can't tell you how many times we've had a deal that is, it's a great deal and this deal is going to make, and I'm not worried about it. You know, I'm thinking, oh, doctor, or buyer loves the seller, seller loves the buyer. We're, we're on easy street. We're going to cruise through. And typically where I see it happen more than, than anything is when another attorney comes in that doesn't know, has never done a dental deal, doesn't know the industry at all, and has done, you know, domestic work or, um, or some kind of you know, court defense work, and they've never done a deal like this before. And they get in, and it's usually the seller's brother-in-law or cousin yeah. who's twice removed. You know, that's also an attorney, and they're going to come in and, and help them do the deal. And it's not that we don't want them to be represented, because I always want the other party to be represented. I want somebody there, because that takes a little bit off our plate, to be honest with you, to have somebody on the other side. But when we get those people that don't know it, and they come in, and what they'll do is they'll negotiate every single point. And what I can tell you about the law practice within dentistry is that we kind of know how deals happen. You know, we know that the industry has helped us carve over time that there are uh, that there's a pathway to get a buyer and a seller together and to get the transaction done. And we know where the negotiating points are within that pathway. And we know what is just accepted because it's been done forever. And it's just the way we do it. Well, when those people come in that don't necessarily know the industry, they'll negotiate those the outside points. And when we then have to negotiate and go back and tell them, we don't really negotiate those, they're, they're just there. We lose a lot of our negotiating muscle because we're wasting it on these things that don't even need to be negotiated. So the biggest threat to a deal, in my mind, uh, is somebody coming in and advising a buyer or a seller that really has no idea what they're advising them to. And it sounds great. I mean, it's really hard to argue against because an attorney is going to show their client. They're going to say, look at all these red lines I made. You know, they bled all over the page and there's ink just flying everywhere. And they say, you know, look what I'm doing for you. I've, I've clocked in 37 hours in the past two days working on your document. But when it comes down to it, all of those things were really did not go to the end of getting the transaction done and, and representing your client in a way that is meaningful in the deal. So yeah. You know, Going back, do I understand why some people push dual rep? Well, sure, I, I understand why they do it uh, to protect the deal. But at the end of the day, I would I, I would not. I just don't do dual rep. You know, we're we're solo. And what I do tell the parties is, we tell a buyer, listen, you know, if you get an attorney that uh, comes in and has never done this before and is new, that's fine. You can pick that attorney, but you just need to know that it may have some ramifications on the deal. And most of the time, they don't. I mean, again, occasionally, we'll get people that just don't have a clue and will come in and they'll just shoot the deal dead four times. But I, I just emailed you um, the my column last month, and I, I wish you'd comment after. It really had a lot of comments. Um, stay in your own lane. I, I just want to summarize where I've seen everything go bad. I tell the dentist, stay in your own lane. You're a trained dentist. You're not an attorney. You don't. You haven't seen 100 deals. And, and then they go pick. They're so... They're so cute. They're adorable. I say, well, why did you pick this attorney? Oh, he goes to the same ward as me. Well, would yeah. you rather have a guy who only does dental or a guy who goes to the same ward as you? I mean, that it, it's cute. I love it. Sure. It sounds right. Sure. But they'll, they'll do things yeah. like they'll buy a practice. I, I saw this where a dentist just cried. He bought a practice by himself, no attorney. He's in this huge shopping center. Turns out the roof starts leaking. He's in a triple net lease. The lady next to him's a yoga studio, so she just says, "Screw it," declares bankruptcy. She, it's a hobby. <laughs> Th this guy had to fix the roof of an entire center, and I'm like, "Well, did your practice broker? Other people, they'll buy a practice. They don't know that the lease expires in two years, 
and that the yeah. the big box retailer, the big Kroger grocery store, wants to knock out that whole wing and expand their grocery store. And and there's just all the and I and I'm like, well, what dental classes educated you for this? I mean, I thought we were taking tooth morphology. I didn't know that we were taking how to negotiate a. a so my article was stay in your own lane. I wish you would give some examples of that column. But but de- doc, you're a doctor of dental surgery. You weren't trained in anything else. And here you have a guy sitting here that's been looking at these deals for, a, you know, 15 years and, and you're a baby. You just got out of dental kindergarten school and you just think, you know, it all, I mean, stay in your own lane. The, the, yeah, the, the think, number one I rule in really legal, legal, the devil's in the details. Absolutely. And there are so many that, I mean, again, not a, it sounds, um, not to pat myself on the back or pat anyone in our industry in the back, but there are a lot of things that you don't know what you don't know. So you don't know what to negotiate and what not to negotiate. And it's generally those things that you don't know not to that cause issues later. So yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm not going to jump in and do my own root canal, um, but we do see a lot of people that do their own employment agreements. That's really where I see it being yeah. prolific is employment agreements. We'll get them in their you know, copy and pasted and in about 12 different font styles. And so we know they're, they've been pieced together and there are generally a lot of things missing and we have to go back and help rebuild it back to a cohesive document that works. And, you know, can it be done? Yeah, but it almost always takes more time to do it that way than it would have if we had just been contacted to begin with. But I think a lot of people have the fear of the fee. You know, they're afraid they're going to call us and we're going to get on the phone and the, the, Clock's ticking and, and the, the dollars are flying out of their wallet while they're talking to us. But I can tell you, a lot of people, a lot of attorneys in the industry that we work with, and you know, we know them well because we're across the table from them, they, it's generally a flat fee or it might be an hourly fee, but they're generally not charging every two seconds they're on the phone. And that's just because, again, uh, having experience in the industry, you know what works and what doesn't work. So, yeah, it, it's great when we can be involved and it's great when we're involved early. We get a question, you know, when should I call you? Should I wait till after we make the offer or or when we found something? Well, I mean, call us as early as you want. Call us, I would much rather be involved early on than to come in later and to have to undo something that's been done when it easily just could have been avoided to begin with. Two, two more questions and I'll let you go. Um, okay. You know, uh, it's about partnership versus uh, marriage divorce. I mean, you know, you go into marriage with yeah. all the great reasons and they fail half the time. Um, a lot of dentists decide, you know what? I'm going to buy this practice with my best friend, Julie. We were yes. sh- we were drinking buddies all through school. We're going to buy this together. Do you think marriage success rate versus divorce, partnership success rate, divorce, do you think they're the same? Um, I mean, um, what, what, um, what, what do you what I think do you, that's a good question. I, I think if, if the two doctors got together and bought a practice because they were good drinking buddies, then, yeah, I think it's probably the same as a divorce rate. Um, partnerships are difficult because you're spending more time with your partner than you probably are your spouse. And that's just the, you know, the fact of the matter. So going in and being very clear and making an informed decision about who you're getting into ownership with is drastically important. So sometimes does it make sense to share the burden and to have multiple doctors in a practice? Absolutely. You only, you know, once you get to those top tier practices, that are just really running efficiently and really working well, it's a lot of times it's multi-doctor. It's a partnership that has produced that level of practice. So on the one hand, do they work? Yes. And can they work very well? Yes, they can. But they take a heck of a lot more work than a solo practice does in just owning it and running it yourself because you have two highly educated people, like you said, highly educated people that are together that are trying to make these same decisions, not upset their partner, uh, still be on that that same level, but maybe you have a different idea or you want to grow this way and they want to grow that way, uh, then it easily becomes a dispute that has to be resolved. And sometimes it's just sitting down and having a conversation that resolves that dispute. But it can also turn into litigation that resolves that dispute. And partnerships are, uh, they're not simple things. So I'm going to say they're simple to put together. They're actually not. They're pretty complicated. But once they're together, they're a heck of a lot harder to take apart once they're together and you're trying to get back out of it if it didn't work out. So I think one of the, the heaviest decisions a practitioner can make in today's legal industry and dentistry is whether to take on a partner or not, whether to go in 
and to equally yoke yourself with someone and try to run this practice together day to day and be together, I think it's tough. Um, I think a lot of people go into it, um, not flippantly, but go into it maybe not thinking or putting as much thought into it as they really should. And then they find out their maybe their personalities were not as well matched as they thought they There's were. There's a hundred dentists on Dental Town who have posted nightmares that the divorce with their dentist partner was twice as bad as the divorce with their spouse. Absolutely. Oh my The worst God. thing I can tell you, hands down, honestly, Howard, the worst thing that I have done as an attorney ever was dissolve a partnership. Oh, I it know. It was and and you tell believable. them a, you tell them a million times, don't get married without a prenuptial agreement. And I don't I still don't think I've met a dentist that got a prenup before they got married. That's how emotional <laughs> that decision is. And I say, okay, well, I I get it with with your lover because your lover is going to have kids and dogs and cats, but you're not sleeping with this dentist. If you don't get a prenuptial agreement and a contract and a conflict resolution and what's the exit strategy and because when when it goes nuclear with no contract, no no prenuptial, oh my God, it can go for years. I know dentists who tied it up in court for four or five years. They spent more on attorney's fees than, than the divorce. Final question. Yeah. Yeah. This yeah. is something I really wonder about a lot. You're buying a practice. Uh, let's just say, would you agree that the average practice you see for sale is a solo for seven fifty? Okay. Sure. So what's yeah. seven fifty divided by fifty? What is that? Hold on, I'll tell you. I'm a trusty calculator here. Seven fifty, fifty, fifteen thousand. Well, 750 divided by 50 would be 15. So, 15, yeah. I so, 750,000. Okay, 750,000 divided by 50,000. So sure, you're yep. buying a $750,000 practice. For just one fifteenth that price, you could also sign up a $50,000 practice management consultant to hold your hand the whole first year's systems in place, everything, this dental practice. I always say, God, for just one fifteenth extra price, even if it was <laughs> one, you know. So my, my question is, do you think if you're going to go all the way to the dance, you might as well buy a dress and some shoes and get a consultant for the first year? Do you think that adds to success or not really? Yeah, Absolutely. I, I really think it does. I believe in practice management. I think learning from other people's mistakes is a very real thing. Uh, and if you can do it, then you're you're doing your job as a business owner. So, yeah, and I think there are a lot of lenders that, that share that uh, because they will actually finance the practice management side of it for the first year or two years or whatever it is. If, again, if it's rolled into the, the loan and the ownership model and all that. But, yeah, I absolutely – like the idea of it. I mean, what at the end of the day, you spent the money, it was an investment in your practice, you're going to get something from it. You know, there's going to be some good thing that comes from that practice management side of it. And having somebody there to tell you, uh, don't do that, do this, do do it this way, as opposed to this way. And here's why I think is easily worth the investment. Any names you recommend? There are a lot of good ones out there. I'll, and I, I'll let people make their own decisions. Okay. Go go to Dental Town now. So we have we have one we have um a bunch of forums on Dental Town, and one of them is um, called uh, Practice Transitions, and it's broken up into Associates Corner, Future Planning, mm-hmm. General Discussions, Life After Dentistry. That's a really neat thread. <laughs> Partnerships and Associates, Practice Acquisitions, Practice Sales, Practice Startups, Retirement Planning. Uh, retired and soon to be uh, retirement dentist forums. So his website is JPA Transitions. And J, just so they remember this, they're driving JPAs for Jordan Practice Advisors. So JPA Dental Transitions.com. Um, seriously, Joe, it was such an honor for you to come on the show oh, today and talk to my homies. Thank you so much. And uh, get that little girl on dad's pictures because when Don't she worry, sees she, that, you're going to get in trouble. All right, have a great day. Thank you, Howard.